Starting us off at number 10 is a plastic bag. That's right, folks, even the deepest spot on Earth isn't free of man's worst creation ever. Single use plastics. During one of the deepest dives ever recorded, famous underwater explorer Victor Vescovo traveled seven miles below the ocean's surface down to the Mariana Trench. While down there, Vescovo and his crew discovered tons of new and interesting things, but not all of them were cool. He reported that he also found a plastic bag and even some candy wrappers. Down at the deepest place on Earth. So, that's cool. Folks, I don't think it's a hard concept to understand, but please don't litter. Things like plastic bags were not made to help out anyone but ourselves. These cause a great danger to our wildlife all around the world, and if we have to use these materials, just please dispose of them properly. No one else should have to put up with your trash except for the garbage man. In our number nine spot today, we have the fact that life exists. The first time anyone ever went on a deep dive into the Mariana Trench, no one was exactly expecting to find signs of life in the extreme environment of the deep sea. So it was quite a shock when they found out it was absolutely teeming with life. Because of the lack of sunlight, or really any light, in the Mariana Trench, you won't find any plant life or algae, but there are tons of living beings, from microorganisms to scary looking fish. All of the life in the trench has had to adapt in one way or another in order to live in this environment, whether that is naturally developing pressure proof shells, or having insane eyesight that can catch even the faintest glimmer, or having other heightened senses that can help detect prey or predators. All of these special adaptations help us understand more about how life in the deep sea evolved, but some can even be used to help us advance scientifically and medically. It is no small feat to head down to the Mariana Trench, but the more we can discover down there, the better. At number 8 we have Jupiter-like microbes. Say what? Back in 2012, during the Deep Sea Challenge expedition, researchers found these fuzzy mats of bacteria clinging to the rocks at the bottom of the trench. Usually one of the first things scientists look for in the harshest places on Earth are any signs of life possible. It helps them understand how life can be possible in parts of the world or even the universe that don't operate like Earth's habitable places. When scientists explored the Serena deep part of the trench with a robotic lander, they found evidence of a thriving microbial community down and around the deep sea rocks. These microbes appear to feed off of the the chemicals produced with the sea when the sea floor rocks react with the water because they don't rely on the falling of the marine snow it raises questions and possible hypotheses for scientists that maybe this is how some life forms exist in the farthest reach of our universe such as Jupiter and Saturn's moons in our number 7 spot today we have the Daikoku seamount this seamount is located within the Mariana Arc and was fairly recently found to be hydrothermally active so basically it is a functioning underwater volcano which is super cool that is not even the cool and unexpected discovery I want to talk about today. During the submarine Ring of Fire expedition in 2006, it was realized that this seamount happens to also feature a pool of liquid sulfur. That might not seem like the most amazing thing, but it is definitely very cool. Firstly, the way it looks is absolutely insane because it has gases rising off of it which appear as smoke, but like smoke underwater. I don't know the science behind it, but all I know is that it looks like nothing I've ever seen before. The next reason why this is super cool is because of the fact that this is almost never seen here on Earth, and the only other time we found a comparable pool of sulfur to this one has been on Jupiter's moon Io. At number 6 we have the Mariana Snailfish. At 8,143 meters below the surface, scientists discovered a new kind of fish they call the Mariana Snailfish. This is a white translucent fish that has broad wing like fins and an eel like tail and slowly glides near the bottom of the ocean floor. You can also see its liver from the outside of its body. Eww. While this is the deepest they have ever found an actual fish, researchers don't believe there is much more swimming below that. The amount of pressure is so high that they don't believe any fish is chemically able to withstand the destabilizing effects of its proteins at the depth. So the Mariana snailfish may just be the deepest dwelling fish on the entire planet, which I'm sure we are all hoping for some large weird space looking like deep sea monster, but for now we will just have to settle for a snailfish. It's okay little guy, I still love ya. In our number 5 spot today we have human mercury pollution. It was once believed that methyl mercury was mostly produced in the top few hundred meters of the ocean, which would have limited the mercury bioaccumulation because it was thought that the fish who make their home in the deep sea would have a very limited opportunity to ingest the methyl mercury. But a recent discovery has shown that this is just not true. According to two separate studies which were presented at the Goldschmidt Geochemistry Conference, there is clear evidence of the presence of both man-made 
carbonate and natural methylmercury, which is quite toxic. This means that since this is spreading to the absolute depths of the Mariana Trench, the pollution is turning out to be much more widespread than what was once thought. They know that it is coming from the mercury in the upper ocean because of some sort of isotope evidence. The reason this discovery is important is because when mercury reaches the depths of the sea, it is turned into methylmercury, the super toxic one, by tiny microbes. From there, it gets eaten by small crustaceans, who then get eaten by fish, who then get eaten by bigger fish, and so on and so forth, and then it gets into our food web, which is dangerous for both humans and animals. It is unclear exactly what is going to happen with this information, but I guess it's good to have the whole picture in order to make the best, most educated decisions. At number four, we have urethene's plasticus. As we learned earlier, the Mariana Trench has not gone untouched by plastics. Well, back in 2014, scientists discovered a new species at 6,900 meters below, and the tiny crustacean was found to already have ingested some of Earth's plastic. Therefore, they gave it the name urethene's plasticus. With the support of the World Wildlife Foundation in analyzing the newly discovered species, scientists found a 6.5 millimeter large piece of large microfiber made up of 80% PET in its body. PET is a substance found in a variety of commonly used household items such as water bottles and workout clothes. Now it's also found in deep sea wildlife, so much that we're naming deep sea creatures after plastics. This one is alarming because in the deepest parts of our planet that we know the least about, even less than space, we're still finding humans making their mark before humans even get there themselves. <laughs> Yikes. Let's hope we don't have to start naming species uh, Rubberus Americanus or even Coca Cola Soft Drinkus. Hmm? In our number three spot today, we have ocean sediment. Okay. There's sediment in all of our oceans, so this one definitely doesn't seem like it should be on this list, but the Mariana Trench sediment is unique because of its extreme depth. While there are of course large fish who eat other fish, what do the small fish and living creatures who don't eat other fish eat? Since there's no plants, that is why researchers collected samples of the sediment that lays on the floor of the Mariana Trench, to see what it is made out of, to see what the heck these guys are eating. As it turns out, if the organisms aren't eating chemicals, they're eating the leftovers from the fish that live closer to the surface of the ocean. These leftovers float down to the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean, which is referred to as sea snow, and that is what becomes the meal for the smallest creatures living in the trench. Kind of gross when you think about it, but I'm happy for them. Coming in at number two, we have scalding hot water. That's right, just like Katy Perry, the Marianas Trench is hot and cold. At the deepest spot on Earth where basically no sunlight can get through, you would expect that the water was extremely cold, right? Wrong. Well, okay, maybe kind of right. The water usually stays between 34 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit, but also wrong. The water at the bottom of the Mariana Trench can also get scalding hot. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, there are many different hydrothermal vents and the water that erupts out of these vents can reach temperatures of 700 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to scald anyone swimming down there. But fortunately, the pressure is way too high for anyone to actually swim down there, so that won't be happening anytime soon. That being said, for those that decide to dive deep, 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 deep down there, make sure that the deep sea sub you're in is not only pressurized, but also has an AC, because you don't want to cook like a boiled lobster. In our number one spot today, we have giant amphipods. I will never not be fascinated by these things, so here we are again with more giant amphipod facts. Amphipods are little crustaceans that can be found in most waters on Earth, and they're kind of like shrimp. The Mariana Trench variety are absolutely shocking compared to the amphipods we are used to, and that is because they are like the Shaquille O'Neal of shrimps. They're huge! These guys can be found 35,797 feet or 10,911 meters deep in the trench, and while most amphipods are like two to three centimeters or about an inch long, these guys are a whopping 34 centimeters or just over 13 inches long. Like what? A scientist explained that the discovery is a bit like finding a foot long cockroach. And I have to say that the surprise may be the same, but I would rather find a huge shrimp than a huge cockroach any day. Before the discovery of these guys, researchers didn't even know that amphipods could grow this large, so it's safe to say that they certainly were not expecting this discovery. Number 10, one dumb diver. This first story is from Reddit user one dumb diver, and boy does he live up to his name. His first mistake was heading out for a 90 foot dive 
alone, but he was just 15 years old and thought how bad could it be. He needed to clear his head so he headed out on his family's boat to the reef. While floating down at 90 feet, second mistake, he was only rated for 60, he saw a 3.5 meter mako shark. Mako sharks according to the diver only have two speeds, curious and lunch mode. Guess which mode this guy was in. Divers now use electronic pulses to freak out sharks, but he was using the older method of a chainmail sleeve. They bite the metal, they think, ugh, gross, swim away. But mistake number three, he forgot the sleeve on his bed at home. Shark bit down, there was now an open, gashing wound in the water, and salt was burning his flesh. Mistake number four, he had drifted a quarter mile downstream from his boat. Luckily, he made it to shore and 172 stitches, physical therapy to repair his tricep, and some crazy scars later, this deep sea diver never made the same mistakes ever again. Number 9. Funny from the outside. Okay, this one is scary and funny at the same time, and yes, it also involves sharks. Sometimes fear of the thing itself makes you do some pretty weird things to avoid it, which eventually makes the worst thing happen. Reddit user NZ Viking Rugger has to wear eye contacts, which makes wearing a mask even more of a necessity. The idea of going without them surpassed any other fears, even as a shark headed straight for her. While on a dive, a friend behind her had collided with a shark and her mask was knocked off. She couldn't stop thinking about the fact that her mask was knocked off, that even as a shark headed straight for her, she was she was more afraid of that. Usually sharks are more curious than anything and usually they just shoulder bump you as they turn at the last minute, but this one wasn't. She was beelining for Viking. She kept calm though and at the last second the shark was about to knock her mask, the diver just headbutted the shark in the nose. She may be the only person to ever headbutt 11 foot shark because she was afraid she might lose her mask. And she's alive, so good for her. Number eight, food poisoning. I, I can't think of a worse time to get food poisoning than like while scuba diving. Actually, I probably can. There, there's probably something worse, like I don't know, in front of like your crush or something like that. But um, this one is definitely up there. Reddit user some guy 12 recounts the moment he had to deal with seeing yesterday's lunch on a deep sea dive. He was 14, a relatively new diver, and just hit 20 meters below the surface with his dad and brother. About 45 minutes out, a foreboding churning began in his stomach. And, well, he started to upchuck into the water. The worst part is that the fish surrounding him thought it was lunchtime. <laughs> And they were like, whoa, look, sandwiches. No one was within arm's reach, so he had to keep clearing his regulator, puke, and then repeat until he was like, all clear. No one noticed, and he just kept on with the rest of the dive. <laughs> I am as horrified as I am impressed with his perseverance, but like, dude, go up to the service. That's enough. Number seven, shark rescue. Being a rescue diver means you often have to put yourself at risk in order to recover people who got themselves into trouble. Keith Ba is a rescue diver in the Bahamas and he was on a mission to find a missing diver. He was submerged in the infamous blue hole in the Bahamas and finally caught a flash of the diver's watch on his arm. He started swimming to the bottom and began to notice that the bottom was moving. An entire school of sharks were swimming right over the body. It was breeding season and there were so many sharks he couldn't see the bottom. He found the diver though and as quick as he could began swimming up to the surface. Thing with diving though is if you rise too quickly you could get something called the bends, aka decompression sickness. The shark started following him and when he reached 70 feet he had to take a break to adjust and therefore spent 8 minutes surrounded by a school of sharks with a dead body in one hand. Ugh, like how he got out of there without turning into shark food is pretty astounding. Number six, shipwrecked. Tom Pritchard had over 1,000 dives under his belt, was known for being incredibly detail oriented and cautious. Nothing should have gone wrong, but of course, something did. Just what remains a mystery. Pritchard was working on attaching a mooring line to the Andrea Doria. The Andrea Doria is a shipwreck 300 miles outside of New York. When the line was attached, the other crew members explored the wreck before rising 75 minutes later. But 
where was Pritchard. The Coast Guard swept the area but no one was found and in the end, the captain ordered the crew not to return to look for him. After all, they had no idea how he disappeared so going back down there could be even more dangerous, they could lose more people. The Doria has always been considered dangerous and has claimed 15 lives previously. As the years go on, the wreckage continues to get less and less stable. But whether Pritchard was trapped by the ship or died due to equipment failure, no one will ever know and it just is no one will ever know. Number five, Snake Island. The problem with deep diving is that if there is a problem, you can't just rush up to the surface or you might literally explode internally decompression sickness. So staying calm is paramount, but it's not always enough. Three divers decided to take on a 180 meter dive in Snake Wall in the Georgia Strait. One of the men stayed in the shallower area while the other two decided to dive as deep as they could. While they were down there, something happened, something went wrong, and while the second diver almost made it to the surface, he too perished as well. They were experienced divers, they wouldn't have been able to go in there if they weren't. So just exactly what happened to the two at the bottom still remains a mystery because it could have been as simple as an equipment failure but there's no proof. Number four, they checked no. There is a reason why high risk activities require you to sign and fill in a waiver or consent form. They ask about your health because you or someone else could be put at risk because of it. This one diver decided to check no on the form when it asked if they had epilepsy. Flash forward to a seizure attack in a pitch black cavern. 85 feet below the water. In this story submitted by Reddit user Sharkbite, they noticed one of the diver's lights weren't moving. After heading over to see what was wrong, they noticed that the diver had no regulator in their mouth, which is the breathing apparatus, and their eyes were completely checked out and their teeth were clenched together. They forcibly purged the air into their mouth with the regulator, which moved their cheeks enough to indicate air was going in. That was good enough for them. The rescue diver then grabbed their arm and swam up straight 60 feet to get them to surface, risking the bends. Once to the shore, the rest of the team helped get their gear off, and though in shock, the diver recovered like nothing happened. Thankfully, they were only 10 minutes into the dive, otherwise they would have both ended up sick. The rescue diver was put at risk, shooting up to the surface to save them both and said they would do it again if need be. And I mean, I would too, but like, boy, would I be pissed. Hopefully this person didn't discover that they have epilepsy below the water. That could be a thing too. But if they knew and didn't say, Ooh, someone's gonna get a stern talking to, wow. Number three, Sanctum. Even the most experienced divers can encounter deadly complications on dives. And to this day, no one knows what brought Agnes Maloka down. Agnes was a stunt diver who had a fierce desire for underwater exploration. By age 29, she'd been featured in multiple documentaries and even acted in the movie Sanctum. But while on a dive in the tank caves in Australia, even her expert navigational skills were no match for the sinkholes, caves, and silt. Somehow she became separated from her diving buddy and silt from the cave walls disrupted her vision. If you breathe too hard, the air bubbles would pop and disturb the ceiling and it would come crashing down. The following day, they found her body 500 meters from the entrance of the cave. Evans suggests that she remained calm until her last breath, but no one knows what the exact reason was for her struggle. Could have been she ran out of air. Anything could have happened, but either way, she lost her life. Number two, Plura Caves. Norway's Plura Caves used to be a spot where experienced divers would test their metal, but ever since this incident, they have been closed indefinitely. In February 2014, several divers prepared to make the long trek to the other side of the cave, but 135 meters down, they lost two of their members. One member, Jari, got stuck halfway in a narrow passage, which caused immediate panic. That far down, that's a very dangerous thing. Fellow diver Patrick handed him an extra cylinder to prevent hypercapnia, which is excessive CO2 in the bloodstream, so like hyperventilating, but Jari panicked while switching and he drowned right in front of Patrick's eyes. Can't imagine that. Patrick did everything he could to stay calm and had to keep moving, but behind them, divers Kai and another man named Jari were due for a shock. Jari saw the body of Jari and panicked, even though Kai tried to help him, and sadly, Jari succumbed to the same fate. With the passage now fully blocked, Kai had to trek 11 hours back the same way he came all the way to the start. Two months later, Patrick and Kai I went back secretly to recover their friends in which they succeeded but no one else is allowed in those caves ever since then. Number one, Dion Dreyer. 
And last but not least, the tale of Dion Dreyer. If this story doesn't haunt you, I don't know what will. Dion passed away in 1994 when his body was lost 270 meters in Bushman's Hole, South Africa. For 10 years, his body remained there, but extreme diver David Shaw decided it was time to bring him home. But the dive went nowhere near as expected. With Shaw's experience in situations like this, there wasn't a doubt in anyone's mind he'd be okay. Shaw assembled a team and made the descent 270 meters down to find Dryer. But when Shaw tried to put the body in a body bag, the skeleton started floating due to the wetsuit Dryer still wore. At those depths, any panic or disorientation could be deadly, and indeed it was for Shaw. As he wrestled with the body and began his ascent, his light got snagged and he panicked because he already overexerted himself. Dave eventually passed out, and before long, Bushman's Hole claimed his life as well. But almost poetically, the two bodies floated up to the surface together. Shaw made sure he fulfilled his mission even with his last breath. Starting us off at number 10, we have sweet wrappers. Some of you might be confused and not know what that is. And if you are one of those people, they are more commonly known as candy wrappers, or trash, or even rubbish, or even garbage. I think you get it now. Anyway, along with that other plastic bag that we talked about in the first video, candy wrappers and tons of other human garbage were found in the depths of the Marianas Trench. The deepest spot on Earth is still not untouched by humans. This is a sad discovery that scientists were not thrilled about, but it was also a huge wake-up call too. So let's continue to be careful with our trash and where we put it. The plastic plastic bag was one thing, but when I found out that that was just the beginning of the human trash that they found down there, that was a little upsetting. So stop eating sweets and candy. I'm, I'm just kidding, I, I know we pretty much can't do that, but just be careful where we put our garbage. In our number nine spot today, we have sea pigs. These guys are a genus of sea cucumber, but they have these little tube-like legs, which is why they look super weird. Not that regular sea cucumbers look exceptionally normal, but these ones look even weirder than the regular ones. They like to live on the seafloor where they move through the sediment searching for their next meal. They eat by extracting tiny little particles of organic matter that have fallen from closer to the surface of the ocean down to the mud on the seafloor. They're like the best little Roombas. Sea pigs tend to measure somewhere around 15 centimeters or 4 to 6 inches long, and they live at a depth of somewhere between 1,200 to 5,000 meters deep in the sea. These guys have their own special little defense mechanism, and that is how their skin carries a natural poison, which would make them a less than ideal meal for their predators. It is quite imperative that these guys stay in their deep sea habitat because they are specifically built for that, and when brought up closer to the surface, they disintegrate. Coming in at our number 8 spot, we have robots. Say what? Are the AIs finally taking over? Are aliens actually just ancient robots like the Autobots and Decepticons? What is going on down there? Well, none of those that we know of. But the reason why we have been able to search and discover new areas of our oceans at such great depths is because scientists and researchers have started using robots, or more commonly known as rovers down at the bottom of the ocean. Just like the rovers we use on the moon and Mars, these underwater rovers can go where humans cannot, as well as retrieve materials that we would never be able to retrieve by ourselves. So as nervous as I am about the robots taking over, I have to tip my hat to them in this regard. So thanks robo dudes. In our number 7 spot today we have the Hydro Medusa. This fancy pants jellyfish came as quite a surprise during a robotic exploration of the Mariana Trench in 2016. What at first looked like some sort of alien spacecraft turned out to be a new unidentified species of jellyfish. At a first sight this jelly had its tentacles splayed out as if it was ready to catch some prey. Apparently the tentacles act as a sort of netting to ensnare and then subdue their potential prey, but this jelly quickly calmed down and continued floating on by. This guy was found near the Enigma Seamount at a depth of 3,700 meters. The really interesting thing about this jelly is in its bell. While the bell itself is translucent, inside are glowing red and yellow bulbs of light. The glowing bulbs of light really do give it an otherworldly appearance, and it is simply amazing to look at. At number 6 we have a retired US Navy officer. Yeah, you heard me. Victor Vescovo is a retired US Navy officer and is one of the 70 people on Earth who have earned the Explorer's Grand Slam title. After Vescovo retired from the Navy, he became a private equity investor with a humongous interest in exploring the wildest places on Earth. He has completed the 7 summits exploring the highest points on Earth from each continent and most recently completed the 5 Deeps expedition where he visited the 5 deepest points on Earth, one of them being, of course, the Marianas Trench. In 2019, 
in the expedition known as the Challenger Deep. Vescovo and his team visited the deepest point on Earth during that expedition at 11 kilometers below the ocean's surface and earned Guinness World Records for their explorations. Vescovo helped fund to hire the amazing team he had on board as well as to build the latest high-tech submarine to reach such depths. They were at an area of ocean that is 1,000 times the pressure of the surface. Big ouch. So if you want to get deep, I suggest you take Victor Vescovo with you. Coming in at number 5 at our halfway mark we have comb jellies. Comb jellies are one of the most beautiful creatures I have ever seen in my life and that is mostly due to their combs. The combs I am talking about are actually plates of fused cilia which help these jellies propel themselves through the deep waters of the Mariana Trench like their own little boat oars. There are other creatures who also have combs but these jellies are the largest creatures with them. Why these jellies are so beautiful is because the combs create a sort of rainbow effect because of the light being scattered in different directions because the cilia are moving. Comb jellies only have one pair of tentacles, but sometimes it appears to be more, but that is because their tentacles can branch out. These jellies don't sting, and instead their tentacles are used as a sort of fishing line to help them catch their prey. Coming in at number 4 is James Cameron. Wait, hold on a sec, Olivia, did I just say Academy Award winning director James Cameron was found at the bottom of the Marianas Trench? You did! I did! Yes, I did. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> oh my god, hashtag fire Dewey. <laughs> Along with making one of his most famous movies ever about an old boat, it was also his lifelong dream of exploring the depths of the Marianas Trench. This guy just can't get enough of the underwater life, and honestly, I can't blame him because it looks super cool. Anyway, back in 2012, Cameron with the team of scientists visited the trench at a depth of 11 kilometers as well. Wait, isn't that the exact same depth as Victor Vescovo? Yeah, kind of. Vescovo was able to reach just a bit further than Cameron, so this time the Oscar goes to Victor. Sorry, Jimbo. But Cameron also helped design a 24 underwater submersible sub called the Deep Sea Challenger in the shape of Titanic. <laughs> just kidding, that would be insensitive. The windows on the sub were 9.5 inches thick, so they could withstand the immense pressure. While down there, they discovered 68 new species, mostly of bacteria, but also also a couple invertebrates as well. So there you go. James Cameron is just not a one trick pony. In our number 3 spot today we have the barrel eye. I can talk about creatures that look otherworldly all day and while the Mariana Trench is full of them, the barrel eye is definitely nearing the top of that list. These guys are also known as spookfish and they have these large protruding telescopic eyes that are enclosed in a transparent dome of soft tissue. That was a long way of saying they have a see through head and it is so weird to look at. These guys can't be taken out of their deep sea environment because they are unable to withstand the change in pressure, so for a while after their initial discovery the only way people who had seen them in the deep sea could show anyone else what they looked like was through drawings. Imagine trying to tell someone that you found a fish with a see through head but you have no evidence to prove it. These guys are usually found motionless just kind of floating in one spot as they don't tend to move around a bunch at a depth of around 600 to 800 meters in the ocean. Coming in at our number 2 spot is the unknown. There is still plenty of unknown left in the Marianas Trench. Countless people have now explored down there but the water is just above freezing and it is extremely dark and the pressure is an immense 8 tons per square inch. Holy burst eardrums Batman! With all the tech that we have today we are still doing all that we can to find new ways of exploring the ocean depths for longer and with more visibility. It's hard to say just how much we have really uncovered when we can only go down there for so long and with just our little rovers, subs, flashlights and Hollywood directors. Either way I I can't wait to see where scientists take us on this next one and who knows, maybe one day I will get my confirmed sea monster that I have been waiting for my entire freaking life. In our number 1 spot today we have the predatory tuna kit. The predatory tuna kit is like the Venus flytrap of the deep sea. These guys are one of the most unique creatures I have ever learned about personally because I don't know any other animal that is like them. They start out life kind of like tadpoles and then they swim until they find their perfect spot either along a canyon wall or on the sea floor. Once they found their spot they plant themselves in place using a natural adhesive that they produce. Once planted they will undergo a huge change and this is where they will stay for the rest of their lives. They are super picky about where exactly they make their homes because it will be where they stay and because they need to make sure that both the chemicals in the water in that area as well as the temperature of the water is just right. Like the three little bears of the deep sea. Unfortunately if these guys get moved from the location they choose to make their home they will die so it is imperative that they are left alone. They basically wait for food to drift on by and like a venus flytrap when they get their meal their mouths will snap shut until they are done digesting. The predatory tunicate is a point of study in the medical world because they actually have been known to help with some more serious medical conditions which is always an incredible thing. Kicking off the list at number 10, let's dive in. Ooh, Barracuda. 
Exploring the deep is dangerous if you're a diver, of course, not because of the deadly ocean life surrounding your every direction, but because if you come up too quickly, major health problems will follow. But if not that, probably a deadly barracuda, equally as scary. This deep discovery was made by user Arira95. I'm pulling real events for this one from real deep sea divers. We're going to the real content for this one, so buckle up. One time, when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her and it was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive at this point, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. I'm sweating reading this. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her staring intently at that shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and they slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore. But still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little more aware of her surroundings when she's diving. I mean, fair, but I mean, no one expects a barracuda. Also, if your mom wants to dive with chains on, that's pretty sick. You won't catch her slacking. Even in the depths of the sea, she's like, I'm ready. I don't care who shows up. I don't care who I bump into. Water shoes and bling, check and check. Let's go diving. Number nine, venomous sea snakes. Last year in the deep waters off Australia's coast, of course it's Australia, always Australia, a sea snake that was once thought to be extinct has been rediscovered. How fun. He's like, ah, psych, you thought. Just when you thought the ocean couldn't get even more dangerous, now we got new sea snakes to worry about. The short-nosed sea snake hasn't been seen in 23 years, and they would often live near Ashmore Reef. But last year, divers found one 67 meters below the surface in the twilight zone, which is pretty wild. Just lurking in the dark, just hanging out, meditating. The Australian Institute of Marine Science is responsible for this discovery, and the team calls this a second chance to protect and further understand the species. And an up-close personal encounter is brought to life from this diver. Apparently, this happens from time to time before major storms. Snakes can sense an oncoming storm, so what they try and do is latch onto something heading in the direction towards shore. So they don't have to burn energy and they can just grab onto like a barrel or something and then just, you know, make its way there. Pretty smart. So this diver was exploring, nothing was going crazy or anything like that, and then he felt a snake wrap onto his leg because he felt a storm was coming in. The diver didn't even know that a storm was coming. The snake did, and he wrapped its snake self around his leg. As soon as I was in the shallows, it uncurled and headed up the beach where it hid under a breadfruit tree. That was from a diver named Specialist Celery. Great name, also terrifying experience. I don't like snakes in water or on land. Next, number eight, surprise tiger shark. Yeah, not something you wanna see diving in the deep, a tiger shark. A glowing shark, left shark, I don't care. I want none of the shark smoke. This deep sea discovery comes from user Stormcutter Sick name, a little bit better of a diver name. They say, I know a guy who was out diving for crayfish and lobster by the ocean. Also, the I know a guy trick, it was totally you. Don't lie to us. Crayfish often hide under the rocks, so as he was diving, a tiger shark emerged from a cave and rammed him, breaking his arm and ribs. <laughs> this guy got shucked by a shark, that's insane. He said the shark was testing him out. Yeah, I'd say. That's pretty sweet, man. I'm glad you survived, honestly. I bet you couldn't wait to tell people what happened. You're like, oh, my ribs? Yeah, I got sideswiped by a tiger shark. Yeah, he's feeling testy. You know how tiger sharks do. If you're wondering what that experience may have looked like, uh, this is footage of a rare tiger shark in New Zealand lurking in the deep. Number seven, humpback mama. This deep dive happened about a year ago. A diver named Sidetrack38, that's their username, not their legal name, although that would be pretty sweet. Sidetrack38, he's like, what's up? They were exploring the ocean one afternoon when all of a sudden they got charged by a mother humpback whale. The divers shared their experience online, saying, her curious calf had swam around us and we were between her and the calf. Two of us never even saw her coming. We were watching the baby, but our third diver, saw her come. She kicked down and swam under us last minute. We didn't see anything until that 60 foot freight train passed just underneath us. Whales are beautiful. They're beautiful but terrifying creatures, my friend. Glad you didn't get a broken rib or back in this case because whales, they like to go pretty deep. Just a view. Just trying to figure us Incredible. out. Incredible. Yeah, this is amazing. Justin, you want all reds off? <laughs> Look at that view. I hope we're getting screen captures of this. Number six, Mako Shark. Mako sharks are one of the fastest sharks in the world. I'll start by saying that. Just get that fact in your head. Given this list so far, I would also start sweating if I were you. This is a scary one. This deep dive horror story comes from username One Dumb Diver. Great name. They clearly made this account just to share this occasion. So let's dive in. 
Nowadays, we dive with shark shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away. But back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve. The idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and then move along. So I wait, it comes over, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, the crunch, it occurred to me that I had left my sleeve on my bed. Now I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water and I trailed blood everywhere. Not an ideal scenario. So once the shock finally wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt and open wounds, they don't feel good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Not great. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which meant that I had to swim back up to it. After getting bitten by a shark, imagine having to swim, that is a nightmare scenario. Glad you're okay. Also, you're not a dumb diver. You're just, you're experiencing the things. You're figuring it out. You're doing great. You're brave. I don't even like going in lakes. Number five, more sea snakes. Coming from Patrick667, about a year ago as well, they posted, so three days ago, I went snorkeling off Mimba Island in Zanzibar. Everything went normal and we started heading back. So I grabbed my net and I put my black fins, my black mask, snorkel and black wetsuit inside. Once back ashore, I grab my bag, jump off the boat and head to the rental office to return said equipment. At that point, I feel my bag is moving somehow. At first look, it seemed like a flat black worm squirming quickly. After rotating the bag, I realized I was looking at only the tail of a one meter long black sea snake, one of the most venomous reptiles ever, trying to get out of the net, like in the lobby. How it got there, I have no freaking clue. That is a nightmare scenario. Imagine being like, thanks so much, I had a great time. Here's a sand dollar. <laughs> also, don't mind the venomous snake. Number four, the frilled shark. Back in 2004, marine biologists discovered this dinosaur, the frilled shark, just hanging out, just lurking about 870 meters below the surface. So if you're anywhere around there, watch out. This one looks like an eel almost. It's so scary looking, it's so slippery and quick. Frilled sharks can grow up to seven feet long and they fight in the dark. They don't need to see to attack you, which is pretty terrifying considering all these deep dive stories are all in the pitch black. So unless you're a deep diver, you're not really gonna run into the frilled shark. Have you ever dealt with one of these? Are you a diver? Are you watching this because you're a diver? Please comment down below if you are. Comment some of your personal experiences. These were a nightmare to read. I couldn't even finish half of them. Everything is so dangerous and so fast underwater. Number three, snapping shrimp. This little guy can literally create a sonic boom as it attacks you, that's how fast it is. You won't see him coming, and neither did this diver. Here's a clip of a mantis shrimp punching through a diver's gear. Yeah, right through their water shoes. Bam! Ah. Ow, that really hurt. They're so quick, oh my God, they're tiny, but they, they really hit. They're often found in coral reefs, oyster reefs, these little guys, these pistol shrimp, they hit their prey at 100 kilometers per hour. And in doing so, a large air bubble is created and because this you know, Mike Tyson shrimp is so quick with the left hook, the following pop is around 200 decibels. The sound alone can stun its prey and if they're lucky, it sometimes kills them. That's how you wanna go out. You don't wanna go out with one of these Superman punches to the neck. Number two, comb stars. Ocean life is by far the scariest thing out there. We have no idea what's in our oceans. We discover some crazy shit every year. Some deep sea fish with bioluminescence are for sure aliens, while others are just natural predators. That looks scary. Like the comb star, for example. This guy was not in Finding Nemo. He would have been a weird addition. A comb star is a starfish that contains tetrodoxin, which is this deadly neurotoxin that can cause paralysis. Yeah, Finding Nemo, that movie would be over in eight minutes if this guy was there. Per every gram of comb star flesh, there's enough toxin to take out 500 mice. So if you have a mice problem, Honestly, you can call one guy. It's a very specific weird call, but I know how you can do it. A little bit of tetrodoxin. Tetrodoxin? Tecrodoxin. That's what it's called. And finally, coming in at number one, the electric eel. Awesome. That's the worst thing I've ever seen. Great. The moray eel, first of all, don't do what he just did. Don't go up to a random eel and start rubbing it like it's a genie lamp. That's not smart. It's not a great dame. You don't want to do that. That was the moray eel. That one can bite your fingers off in like two seconds. But you should never touch an eel in the first place because a lot of them are electric. Yeah, just like that MGMT song that's now stuck in our heads. As its name suggests, there's types of eels that can mess you up even if you were to get the first hit. Specifically, the newly discovered two and a half meter Electrophorus volti. Appropriately named after Alessandro Volta, AKA the guy who invented the battery, this eel can release a shock up to 860 volts, which is more than seven times the voltage of a wall plug. 
A swimming wall plug that gets hungry. Nice, we love nature. I'm never swimming again. Number 10. Yellow Brick Road. Deep sea divers may have found the road to Atlantis this year. Yeah, this is a good one. May 2022, this bizarre path was spotted in the Pacific Ocean after an exploration vessel, Nautilus, caught the rocky formation next to Hawaii. The exploration team said in a recent interview with We On News that our corps of exploration have witnessed incredible and unique fascinating geological formations while diving on the Lily Yukalani Ridge. The 90 degree fractures are most likely the result of eruptions from long ago. So, but volcanic activity, it's not a yellow brick road after all, but it is cool to look at. This area of the ocean is the largest fully protected conservation area in the world, and this explains why. Literally, there's Wizard of Oz stuff happening below. No one wants to tell us anything. Covering more than 580,000 square miles. So far, we've only discovered 3% of the seafloor, so I'm sure there's many more discoveries coming our way. Number nine. Norfolk's Royal Shipwreck. Okay, so this initial discovery happened way back in 2007, believe it or not, but it was a secret until recently. Now I'm here to tell you all the tea. On May 6th in 1682, a ship called the Gloucester got stuck in a sandbank off the coast of Norfolk. And then an hour later, she sank. Now one of these passengers was the future King James II of England. He escaped in a small boat, thankfully, quick decision that literally changed the course of history. These two diving brothers found the ship back in 2007, but now it's official, now it's confirmed so now we can talk about it. Just last month, it was officially announced. This was the lost ship indeed. Maritime expert Claire Jowett calls this recent discovery the single most significant historic maritime discovery since the raising of the Mary Rose. Number eight, Crusader Sword. Me, personally, I'm a shell guy. Love the shells, maybe rocks every now and then. I see a nice shell, I'm going for it, okay? I don't care who's living in there. I gotta listen, sounds of the sea. But a sword that once belonged to a Crusader Knight? I mean, sure, that's fun too. Shells, swords, they're both good. An Israeli scuba diver, not even that far experienced, ended up stumbling across one of the coolest discoveries back in 2021. Shlomi Katzen was diving off the Caramel Coast in Israel, and as well as a badass sword, the diver also found anchors, ancient stones, pottery fragments, all from around 900 years ago. See, me and myself, I wouldn't even notice this. It's covered in barnacles. It doesn't even look like a sword, other than the shape. Maybe the odd shape of a sword. That's it. That's a great find. No submerged curses, no Mayan ruins, just, just a nice cool sword. We love that. Number seven, the Great Lakes Griffin. Back Back in 2018 in Lake Michigan, diver Steve Libert found what he believed was the holy grail of Great Lakes shipwrecks. The Griffin sank back in 1679. Divers have been searching for this beauty for years and years. Now as a kid, Steve Libert was talking about the shipwreck when his history teacher stopped and said, hey, who knows? Maybe one of you will find the Griffin. Imagine that. Your grade 8 teacher tells you that somebody might find a ship and that somebody ended up being you. Fascinating. So at 67 years old, he discovered the wreck. It was 2018, but his research began and 40 years prior. It's a long time coming. Liebert began diving in 1981. It took a very long time to track this one down. So if you're in any Great Lakes, keep your eyes open for, you know, 50 foot long ships from the late 1600s. Number six, Magnificent Alien. Okay, tinfoil hats, put them on folks. Now's the time. In a list of deep sea discoveries, how don't I talk about this little guy? While the rest of the world was in panic mode, a new sea sponge was discovered back in 2020. It was named Advina Magnifica, which translates to Magnificent Alien. Yeah, this sponge literally gets its name because it looks like E.T. And to be fair, it looks like an alien. It looks like a literal extraterrestrial. An ROV found this sample over 6,000 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean. They found it in what they called a forest of weird, which is a cool nickname, I guess. Christiana Castello Bronco, the researcher who found this deep sea squishy, explains the discovery in an NOAA interview, saying that all these organisms are intricately connected. By documenting and describing marine diversity, we are building a better understanding of life and the impact of humans on Earth. In this case, in the ocean. End quote. This little guy could be the key to humanity's survival. I feel it. He looks confident, doesn't he? He looks like he knows what's up. Number five. Comb stars. Ocean life is by far the scariest thing out there. We have no idea what lies in our oceans, and that scares the shit out of me, honestly. We discover some crazy fish every single year. Deep sea fish with bioluminescence are for sure aliens, while others are just natural predators that we haven't seen yet. Like the comb star, for example, which is a starfish that contains tetrodoxin. Tetrodoxin is a deadly neurotoxin that can cause paralysis almost instantly. For every gram of comb star flesh, there's enough toxins to take out 500 mice. And before you ask, no, we don't have an antidote yet. So avoid all the oceans, please. Number four, toxic waste. We mentioned in this list a 900 year old crusader sword. That was a good time, but not all discoveries are the most amazing, okay? Many deep sea ROV trips are not ideal. We don't want to discover what's going on down there. We don't want to know. We don't always find a mammoth tusk or a glow in the dark shark. Sometimes we find this. 
Sometimes we find barrels of waste. This dump site here was discovered off the coast of LA, 3,000 feet deep. ROVs found around 27,000 barrels of toxic waste. Yeah, the 2021 discovery was deemed staggering. I'll definitely agree with that one. You can literally see this aura of toxic waste coming from all these spots. It's brutal, this is horrible. No fish in sight, wonder why. Number three, the deepest shipwreck. The USS Johnston was a US Navy destroyer which sank during the Battle of Samar in 1944. It sank after a battle with a large fleet of Japanese Japanese warships. Victor Vescavo, who was one of the few people who has made the dive into the Marianas Trench, was one of the people who first stumbled upon the remains of said sunken warship. The ship's remains were first found in 2019 and was known as the deepest known shipwreck as it was found 6,456 meters deep in the Philippine Sea in the Pacific Ocean. We now have a new record holder, believe it or not. The world's deepest, deepest shipwreck was discovered four miles underwater in the Philippines. The US destroyer sunk during World War II and it sits at the depth of 22,000 916 feet. The USS Samuel B. Roberts, or the Sammy B, probably won't be beat record-wise. This is extremely rare and so deep. I can't even fathom how deep this is. Number two, Mayan caves. Back in 2018, a diver was exploring flooded caves in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. They were diving around and saw this peculiar opening, so they just had to check it out, right? The divers accidentally discovered one of the largest underwater cave systems in the world. That ought to be fun. It's better than a sword, I guess. A team of divers then explored many kilometers of Mayan history. Bones everywhere. A lot of bones. National Geographic of course got involved and explains that these skulls, given the amount found, were more than likely involved in some sort of ancient sacrifice. Yeah, they found an ancient burial site underwater. See ya. I'd go right back up so fast. Many elongated skulls were found, suggesting that the ancient Mayans were up to something a little darker last time these caves were occupied. If curses are real, there's probably a few in here, so... Avoid them. And finally, number one, a cursed tablet. Well, I'll just list off with a super recent discovery. It's small, but it is mighty. This tablet here was discovered and it comes in at just two centimeters by two centimeters. Very small. Discovered in 2022 in the West Bank, this artifact has historians scratching their heads because it's a couple hundred years older than any Hebrew text previously. It predates the Dead Sea Scrolls by 1,350 years. These ancient letters, once translated, mean to call on to anybody who breaks this curse. There's around 40 proto alpha alphabetic letters, early Hebrew writing, all folded onto this tiny little lead tablet. Also, the fact that this small tablet mentions the curse of Yahweh is pretty alarming. The sediment comes from excavations done in the 80s on Mount Ebal, so many believe that this is from the ancient stone structure, Joshua's altar, which would make sense. The tablet was dated to around 1200 BC, and the chemical isotopes in the tablet suggest that it's from mountainous ranges in Greece, or possibly from the Mountain of Curse. Yeah, the Mountain of Curse? That's a hard pass for me. That's worse than Death Mountain in Zelda. I'm out. Coming up in our number 10 spot, we have the ghost shark. The ghost shark lives in the deep ocean and lives for about 30 years. It looks like a ghost, but arguably even scarier than one. It eats primarily crabs, shellfish, sea urchins, and octopus. Apparently, these fish have been around even longer than dinosaurs. Their big eyes can appear dead in the water, but glow when they are exposed to light, giving them that ghostly look. In our number 9 spot, we have the Atlantic wolffish. The Atlantic wolffish kind of looks a bit like a blob with very sharp canine like teeth. So sharp that it can crush the shells of sea urchins and crabs very easily, and that is what they eat. They can live at depths of 2,000 feet, and apparently they can produce an antifreeze that keeps their blood pumping in freezing water. This fish's overbite and general scary look definitely terrified us humans when we discovered it. In our number eight spot, we have the red lipped bat. Fish. This fish is found near Peru at the depths of 10 to 249 feet. They eat small fish and small invertebrates, including shrimp, crabs, worms, and mullets. They aren't good swimmers, but they use their pectoral, pelvic, and anal fins to walk on the ocean floor. Like this. <laughs> anal fins. <laughs> what? I'm five. <laughs> I wonder if whoever discovered this fish was more confused than scared to have found a fish that literally looks like it's wearing red lipstick. In our number seven spot, we have the dragonfish. The deep sea dragonfish lives about 2,000 feet below the surface and is most certainly a ferocious predator. I mean, look at their teeth. They are clearly born to be fierce. They are quite long, coming up on six and a half inches. And yes, they do have wing-like fins, which is definitely why they were called dragonfish. They are also called 
called the sea moth, which, yeah, no. <laughs> that makes them seem less cool, because, you know, moths are a pain. So we're gonna stick with the dragonfish. Little is known about their history thus far, which is just another reminder that the ocean is huge and we have so much more to learn. In our number six spot, we have the Dumbo octopus. I can't think of the Dumbo octopus without thinking, aw, so cute, it's like Dumbo. It has protruding ears that are like fins and that is why it was given the name. Its fins act like propellers and propel them upwards like so. Personally, I don't think this creature is very scary, maybe because the cute name put it in a positive light, but if you are someone that feels uncomfortable looking at a cluster of dots, don't look at its legs. I am that person and just looking at its suction cup identical legs made me a tiny bit queasy. Apparently there are about 15 different Dumbo octopus species, which is pretty cool. And also they live in the depths of at least 13,000 feet. They are the deepest living octopus known to man as of yet. They measure to about 8 to 12 inches and they can measure to about 6 feet high. They are quite hard to spot as they are known for their ability to camouflage. Pretty cool. In our number 5 spot we have the frilled shark. The frilled shark can live to depths of up to 5 thousand feet which means they were most likely not spotted by a casual diver. This eel-like shark has six pairs of gills that are across its throat. It usually swallows its prey whole but it's 300 teeth would also guarantee that its prey would most likely not escape anyway. This fish is referred to as a living fossil as it looks so similar to its ancient ancestors. Honestly, this fish looks old and worn and a little bit like a snake. Honestly, it looks like it could be the demon of the sea. In some pics of this shark, it looks truly terrifying and everyone, including divers, would be scared if they were ever to stumble across this fish. In our number four spot, we have the giant squid. The giant squid squid is indeed giant. It is 40 feet long. That's about 12 meters. Yeah, this definitely scared the breath out of some diver somewhere upon its discovery. It is one of the largest animals without backbones in the world. They live at depths of 1,000 to 2,000 feet, which definitely has made them hard to study. Apparently, they also have the largest eye in the animal kingdom as their eyes are about 10 inches in diameter. They are carnivores, so they usually eat deep sea fish, young sharks, smaller squids and humans. Just joking, but honestly, I'm sure if they had the opportunity to eat you, I bet you they would. In our number three spot, we have the gulper eel. Okay guys, let's be real, a diver wouldn't be able to see most deep sea fish because, well, we can't necessarily dive into the deep sea yet, <laughs> lol. However, I'm sure divers have seen them via pictures and after being captured in deep sea fishing nets, so there's that. The gulper eel is one of them that was most likely seen because of a deep sea fishing net. This fish has one large mouth and its mouth is bigger than its whole body, which makes it a tad scary to look at. It usually feeds on on small croatians so there's really nothing to fear it wouldn't eat you it has a long pink fluorescent tail that helps attract prey with its light i personally think it is quite chilling to look at and would love to know if you agree in the comment section below in our number two spot we have the hatchet fish so many scary fish i'm gonna have to put on something funny after this like the big bang theory my newest obsession i know i'm late to the game whatever yeah girl is a late bloomer the deep sea hatchet fish basically looks like an alien with its big bulging eye. Oh, and you know, it glows in the dark. Yeah, glows, pretty cool. Which honestly makes it maybe one of the coolest fish. Cool, but terrifying. It has a row of luminescent organs lining its belly. It apparently mimics daylight above, which throws off predators below it. They live at depths up to 3,200 feet. They have a pretty large mouth that is tilted upward and opens wide to scoop up meat. In our number one spot, we have the goblin shark. When this shark was discovered, surely everyone was terrified. It literally looks like a goblin trapped in a shark body. This creature is one of the most scary looking deep sea creatures that I have ever seen. Barely they can be as long as four meters, but some hypothesize that they can be longer. They have very long snouts and protruding mouths that hold many, many teeth that contribute to their scariness. They can crush their prey, such as shellfish, 
easily with their teeth. They can eat a fish whole, and that is usually what their diet consists of, rat tails and dragon fishes. They can weigh up to 460 pounds. Their lifespan is quite long at 30 to 35 years. Even though it looks quite terrifying, it does have a flabby body with small fins, so it can have quite sluggish movement. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Foraminifera. These guys are giant, single-celled organisms that are kind of like oversized amoebas, and they can be found in the sediment on seabeds throughout the world. In 1995, however, when Japanese researchers were able to collect samples of sediment located in the Mariana Trench, they found 432 living Foraminifera. I know I made these guys sound really large before, but I just mean large in terms of the single-celled organism world. They are still super tiny and they are usually found with a hard outer shell, but not these ones that were found in the trench. These guys have found a way to adapt by basically building their own shells from proteins, organic polymers, and even sand. The ones most commonly found in the Mariana Trench are called xenophyophores, and these guys use the fact that grains of sand are mostly made of silicone dioxide, which is the main constituent of glass, to their advantage. They basically glue sand from ocean sediments, cast off shells, and microbial skeletons to make their own kind of pressure proof shells. So I guess these guys really are like the engineers of the deep sea. In our number nine spot today, we have the benthocodone. We have all seen a jellyfish before, but these deep sea dwellers are unlike any of the ones that we usually find. Firstly, they prefer depths of around 2,500 feet or 762 meters, usually right on the sea floor. These guys are actually quite small and compact with their bell usually measuring just two to three centimeters in diameter. Despite their small size, however, they still have around 1,500 little wispy tentacles that help to propel them through the icy cold depths. These jellies like to chow down on small crustaceans and tiny unicellular organisms, but sometimes their meals are bioluminescent, which is what has led them to develop one of the other unique features on these jellies. This unique feature would be the red color that can be found in part of their bell. Most jellyfish we know of are transparent, and if this was the case for these ones, their bioluminescent meals would be a dead giveaway for the larger hungry predators lurking around the deep sea. This is why the bit of a red that they have in the bell is so important to their survival as it acts as a cover for this blue glow so that they continue on their merry way throughout the dark depths of the ocean. In our number eight spot today, we have aluminum plated amphipods. These guys are found throughout the Mariana Trench, including in the Challenge deep, which is the deepest part of the trench. Amphipods usually have shells made out of calcium carbonate, but the extreme environment in these guys' habitats makes their shells basically just dissolve. They of course can't just be walking around naked and shellless, so what do they do? They adapt in order to preserve their shells. After collecting some of these guys from the deepest parts of the ocean, scientists were able to realize that their exoskeleton contained aluminum on the surface, which then led to the question, how did these guys feel? find the metal since it is pretty sparse in seawater. Well, as it turns out, these guys use sugar-based chemicals in their bellies to extract aluminum ions from the mud on the sea floor that it ends up ingesting while devouring the plant debris that floats down from the surface. In alkaline seawater, these aluminum ions form what is called aluminum hydroxide gel, which is a compound that we as humans use for things like protecting our upset stomachs from stomach acid. This gel then coats their shell and acts as a type of of chemical protection so as to keep the calcium carbonate exoskeleton from dissolving. I don't know, I just think that's one of the coolest things that I've ever heard a shrimp do. This is the first known amphipod to do something like this and these guys are now an important part of researching how maybe one day we can find an environmentally friendly way to produce aluminum. In our number 7 spot today we have the deep sea hermit crab. Ok, many of us have seen or at least heard of a hermit crab before, so at first thought they are the weirdest thing out there, but as it turns out the deep sea variety variety is quite interesting. Instead of these guys carrying around empty gastropod shells like the hermit crabs we are used to, these guys instead carry around sea anemones, and it is one of the weirdest looking things I've ever seen in my life. It looks like these crabs are missing a pair of legs, but instead the legs have actually been adapted to hold the anemone in place. It's definitely an incredible evolutionary advancement for these crabs, but I just can't help but be creeped out by it. In our number 6 spot today we have barophilic bacteria. 
This bacteria is characterized by its preference for an environment with pressure greater than atmospheric pressure, which of course makes a place like the Mariana Trench a perfect candidate for a home. These bacteria have been isolated from deep sea environments and found to grow rapidly at low temperatures and high pressures. This low temperature high pressure combo that is found in the deep sea environment is usually the cause for the decrease of the fluidity of lipids, as well as the depression of the function of biological membranes. But this doesn't happen in this bacteria, which has led to the theory that they must have some sort of mutation to have a sort of mechanism that allows their lipids to adapt to their extreme environments. Aside from their superpower, these bacteria help to support life by being a source of carbon for the deep sea animals that end up ingesting them. In our number 5 spot today, we have vent crabs. Vent crabs are so named because they absolutely love and thrive in the extreme environment that is found at hydrothermal vents. These white crabs are actually endemic to hydrothermal vents and they were first described in 1980. The crabs in this family are usually blind and abundant. In fact, their numbers are so vast that scientists often use the clusters of them to help find the location of hydrothermal vents. The eyes of vent crabs are what I really want to talk about today because they change throughout their life, which helps them adapt to their environment. Young vent crabs usually have eyes that would be comparable to their shallow water companions, but upon metamorphosis, their eyes degenerate and they become naked retinas. Hydrothermal vents produce light in the infrared wavelengths, and this change in the vent crab's eyes was made through evolution because it actually allows them to better see this light, although it causes them to not be able to see most other things. It's like a similar concept to night vision goggles. So basically, vent crabs have night vision. Kind of. It is so interesting to see and learn about how deep sea creatures adapt to their individual environments and circumstances. In our number four spot today, we have baby shark. So apparently, shark fetuses with two heads are becoming more common around the world. Who would have thought? According to experts, the mutation that leads to this trait is known as axial bifurcation, and it's seen not just in sharks, but other animals as well, including humans. The question though is why it is starting to happen more and more often in sharks. Sadly, this mutation has quite a negative impact on the sharks, as it is unlikely that the sharks with this mutation will even live to see their own birth, but for those who do survive until birth, it is highly unlikely that they will survive long in the wild. Right now, scientists are working hard to figure out what is causing this mutation specifically in the sharks. The leading theories include overfishing, which is leading to a smaller gene pool and thus a higher susceptibility to genetic mutations, or even potentially things like metabolic disorders, pollution, or viral infections. In our number 3 spot today, we have the brittle star. This is a species that was found in 2011, but it took 10 years for it to be researched and fully classified, which happened just last year in 2021. This is a species of brittle star that was found during an expedition on the Banque Durand Seamount, which is off of the coast of New Caledonia in the Pacific Ocean. This specific brittle star first caught the attention of experts because of two atypical features. One was that it had eight arms. This was unusual because most have five. And the other unusual feature is their eight sets of razor sharp teeth. It is believed that these teeth, which line every jaw, are used to snare and shred their prey. This creature definitely is quite remarkable and is the product of millions of years of evolution, where it has adapted and changed greatly to fit its needs in the changing environment around it. But it is likely the last survivor of an ancient lineage which dates back to the Jurassic period. In our number two spot today, we have giant giant isopods. Despite their appearance, these guys are neither aliens or pill bugs and are just one of those strange and weirdly large deep sea creatures. These rather large crustaceans can reach lengths of around 15 inches and while that's not the biggest deep sea creature out there, that's pretty insane for the isopod world. These guys get their size from what is known as deep sea gigantism, which is an evolutionary tendency for deep sea creatures to grow larger than their shallow water counterparts. It isn't exactly clear why this happens, but it does and is seen in a few different species. It is thought that this may be due to the cold temperatures, which may increase cell size and lifespan, which both may lead to increased body size. In our number one spot today, we have the deep sea dragonfish. These guys are a pretty 
pretty strong contender for strangest looking animal on this list. These predatory fish use their fang like teeth to grab onto their prey in their dark, cold, deep sea environment. They have no scales and instead have slippery, eel like skin, which only adds to their creepiness level. Similar to the angler fish, which you might be familiar with thanks to the Disney Pixar classic Finding Nemo, these guys have a little lighted barbell that hangs from its lower jaw in order to attract its prey towards it. These fish really use bioluminescence to their advantage, but they also have another, less common ability. Firstly, since many of their prey are also bioluminescent, they have adapted to have a special stomach that will ensure that the light cannot be seen from inside of their stomach so as to not give away their position. Secondly, they are able to produce a red glow. This glow is thought to perhaps be used to signal other dragonfish, but it is definitely used by them to illuminate and detect their prey. They are the only known fish that has the ability to both produce and see red light, as most fish can only see more of a blue light. Mm -hmm.